Welcome to the Lake Bluff School District 65 Board of Education regular meeting for November 14th, 2017. Can we have a roll call, please? Sure. Susan Ryder. Present. Philip Put. Here. Mark Berry. Present. Leanne Charlo. Present. Julie Godshall. Present. Richard Hegg. Absent. John Morosi. Present. So we have a quorum. We can begin. So if everybody would join me in standing and say the place, I appreciate it. item public comment if anybody would like to address the board please feel free to do so if not we'll move on to item five uh, where we have the opportunity for the board to add or suggest an a future agenda item or a discussion item that needs to be addressed um, I have something I'm going to raise if anybody else wants to go first no I have been having as you guys probably already know I, I meet uh, almost monthly with the board presidents from Lake, Bluff, Lake Forest, the high school board, Reese Marcus, and, and their elementary board president, uh, Mike um, Borkowski. And for a long time, coming back years, I've been talking about curricular articulation and feel like we're making some good headway, suddenly. And so I bring to you the opportunity to talk a little bit about curricular articulation. I can't even say it. <laughs> curricular articulation. And I looked up a def definition just to set the record for all you know the crowds watching on television. Um, curricular articulation refers to the logical progression of learning objectives from grade level to grade level, from course to course within the curricular content areas. Articulation explains the connectivity of learning that creates seamless learning throughout a student's educational experience. I like that. But I would also add, especially in our case, that this should extend from pre-K all the way through to 12th grade, across buildings and across districts, all of whom feed into the same high school and desire the same outstanding end result. Um, as you may or may not be aware, historically, the three districts, 65, 67, and 115, have occasionally struggled with articulation or whatever we were calling it at that time. Um, and I think the big reason is we've never had a formal process or a formal agreement between the three schools that I'm aware of that mandated articulation. Uh, an example that comes to mind of a problem that people might be aware of that there's going to be some, I don't want to get into debate about the cause or the root, but I think it might have been avoided had we had a, 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 a formal articulation agreement in place was this whole kerfuffle about uh, algebra, advanced algebra, and honor, the honors classes at the middle school, the high school, and where does it happen, and how's that managed? Um, I think if we had a more formal process in place, that, that might not have been there. So, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to ask you guys uh, to authorize Dr. Sophie to direct our administrators to dedicate time to solving this articulation problem and to report back to the board with recommendations for action. Uh, the board presidents from 115 and 67 have both agreed to bring this same thing to their boards to ask that their superintendents, direct administrators, probably principals, to work together, form some kind of committee, and, and solve this articulation issue that we have um, not quite got our heads wrapped around. So hoping to discuss that a little bit and hopefully tell Gene to go ahead and move forward with it. Tonight? Perfect. If we, it, unless you think we need a formal resolution to vote on to do that. Yeah, uh, I, I, think I think that uh, sounds good. No, I, I think it's, thanks for participating, and, and, I, think it's and, a, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I think you'd have a lot of people happy with that. We accept the responsibility. <laughs> All right, and, and what is a reasonable time frame to ask for reporting back? Um, we can report back on plans. No, I, mean, I wouldn't expect, you know, the final. I'd like say in the spring, we'll, spring we'll report back. All right. Good. I think um, that's great. We can tell you of our progress this year and what our plans are for next year. Yep, and, and uh, Mike Borkowski and Reese Markison have, have told uh, Mike Simic that they were going to raise the same issue at board meetings, and so hopefully that all goes smoothly and it all comes together. So let, me know if, let me know if you run into resistance and I can reiterate with those guys. Um, all right, so then we're going to move on to the next item for recognition, and we start with 
principle recognition and noting that we, as a board, missed principle recognition week, which was in October, but we didn't forget it. And do I go to the now? This is actually you can just I think you can read it because we've honored we sent out school messenger, but specifically it would be Margaret St. Clair and Tracy because they both leave the building, and then Nate and Kelly who leave middle school. So these proclamations were all given to the principals, is that correct? We did not give them the proclamations, we did cards and other okay. things. Okay, so we're gonna read the Principal Appreciation Proclamation. Whereas school principals play an important role in the education and growth of children in elementary, middle, and secondary schools across the state of Illinois, and whereas school principals are responsible for promoting education and working with parents and teachers to ensure that each child receives services that meet their needs, to excel in the classroom. And whereas, it is, in, it is the primary responsibility of the state of Illinois to preserve and improve resources for schools so that all students have the opportunities to receive quality, of educa quality education and the foundation for a successful year, future. And whereas, the Illinois Principals Association, which represents more than 5,000 educational leaders statewide, believes that learning is a lifelong process, and that the education of our children is the highest priority. And whereas, for that reason, the Illinois Principals Association is dedicated, to, is dedicated to developing, supporting, and advocating for innovative school leaders. And whereas, educational leaders face many challenges in educating our young people. And it is through their perseverance and passion that Illinois is able to continue to produce quality, career-ready students. And whereas, we must continue to encourage, support, and recognize those who have a positive impact on Illinois students and the educational system in the land of Lincoln. Therefore, I, Bruce Rauner, Governor of the State of Illinois, do hereby proclaim the week of October 15th and 21st, uh, 2017, as Principals Week, and Friday, October 20th, 2017, as Principals Day, the Illinois, to recognize principals and the Illinois Principals Association for all they do to help our children learn and su succeed. So, thank you for all you do. We appreciate all the hard work. B, board member recognition to Dr. Sophie. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys realize tomorrow is not a Hallmark holiday, but in schools it's a very important day because it's school board members day, November 15th. I checked my Facebook, I saw that it's on there. So, uh, <laughs> oh, we, you, you, you shot, the, you, you went early. We, we went early, we wanted to make sure everybody was on it. Um, I, am, I am not going to read the whole resolution, but I highlighted some of the words, because once again, I think there's some things in the community that people don't know. And I'm going to go straight to the first This is Bruce Rauner? Who's this from? No, this is not Bruce. This is the School Board Association. All right. One of the things I wanted to start with is our seven board members selflessly volunteered countless hours in public service with no compensation. I think that's important. You're charged with meeting the community expectations and aspirations for the public education of their children, entrusted with the guardianship and wise expenditure of scarce tax dollars, responsible for maintaining and preserving the building grounds and other areas of the school district, to give all of us a shared vision of public education for your schools here that set high standards for the education of all of our students to adopt public policy to give voice to that leadership and employ a superintendent to administer the board policy. You're also in charge of regular monitoring of the district's performance and compliance with state policy. Decisions made by school board members directly impact the quality of life in their communities, placing them as the front line of American democracy. Therefore, be it resolved by our school district, Lake Bluff School District, that we proclaim November 15, 2017 as School Board Members Day as a way to honor those citizens who devote their time and energy for the successful education of our children. And we have a little something for you. So Shelly, if you could bring me Mark's bag <laughs> so we can show everybody what we have and then we'll get everybody their own individual bags. We, every year we try to get cre more and more creative. So this year... <laughs> How can you outdo the coffee mug? I, I know, I love my coffee mug. Uh, I, 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 I don't think I ever got a coffee mug. I, 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 first of all, 
before we go, a little flash for all of you, and I would like Mark to open his so you can see what they are. There's no pictures. Oh, this is a little, it's a, called a Wordle, and it talks really about all the things that are important. One, one voice, credit for it, calls it Wordle, all the big words that we use. <laughs> And then all of you, when you get your bag, so are going to have this beautifully designed link from District 65. That is awesome. That is nice. Very nice. That is nice. And I will share one of your colleagues who will is here this evening. When I emailed all of you for your sizes, you gave me every size from a sock size to a tie size <laughs> to a shirt size. <laughs> Don't we have, and we have one other thing, Shelly, for Mark. Mm -hmm. So it's cold out. Uh, do we have an umbrella or something for Mark? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, and your board members need to know, Mark moved to a new level of distinction within the IASB, so he now has a Lake Bluff 65 umbrella. <laughs> so Shelly, if you could bring the board members up here, Kelly can help you bring up their bags really quick. I want to thank each and every one of you for the countless hours you spend countless. guiding our district. We really appreciate everything you do and wear your shirts with, with pride. pride. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And happy Board Members Day. Thank you. Lake Bluff swag. Swag. We're going to be styling. Okay. So, we are going to wrap up recognition with a star employee. I'm going to hand this over to uh, Jay Kahn, but we want to introduce Mr. Steve Miller, who keeps this place running. Hello. Well, I don't have a proclamation from Governor Rob. <laughs> We'd still like to recognize Steve for all of his hard work and dedication. Steve is passionate about providing a safe, comfortable, and clean facilities for the students, staff, and community in Lake Bluff. Steve knows the buildings inside and out, and he played an important role in the design committee for the LBMS renovation. He provided valuable insight that influenced the design of the building, though he didn't get everything he wanted. <laughs> Uh, when the air conditioning went out at LBES this summer, Steve devised a way to cool the building at night with outside air and strategically placed fans all over the building to keep it as comfortable as possible during the day. And he's, of course, playing a role in the design of the solution. Steve is frugal with his budget and stretches it by researching what he buys and looks for the best value, getting multiple quotes for big items and selectively saving items that we can reuse instead of throwing them, throwing them away. He is uh, gradually converting the school's lighting to LED to reduce energy costs and has beautified the buildings by saving and reusing plants and bringing in his own plants and placing them around <laughs> the schools. Steve provides leadership to and supervises a team of six and as well as overseeing the night crew. Um, by properly equipping and our maintenance staff and utilizing their skills, he's saved the district tens of thousands of dollars by doing work in-house rather than hiring contractors for things such as snow removal, painting, HVAC, duct, duct work, and plumbing. He's responsible for all the building setups and making sure our crosswalks are safe. He was involved in setting up and maintaining our recycling and composting program. Uh, Steve always re receives compliments during life safety inspections from the inspectors for doing a great job of keeping the building safe and in compliance. Um, Steve is the guy who gets woken up in the middle of the night by building alarms <laughs> and who comes in before dawn and on weekends to clear snow. It is not a glamorous job, but it is vitally important and one of those jobs that unfortunately usually only gets noticed when something goes wrong or is missed. <laughs> so I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank Steve because it makes my job much easier knowing that I can trust that he is on top of everything. And the board and administration want to publicly recognize Steve to show our appreciation for all that we know he does for the district and even more for all the things that most people don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
prepare anything. Is this actually working? I didn't prepare anything, uh, but I really appreciate the acknowledgement. I, I mean, in all sincerity, um, I am a very open, honest person, sometimes a little too passionate. Uh, I always have the best interest in the children and the, this process of the education. Um, I truly appreciate uh, not having children not being involved in any, in any school functions and, and behind the scenes. I've learned a massive amount about what it takes to uh, support the educational process and for the children. And, and it's truly a blessing to see all the volunteers over the 15 years I've been here, um, again, putting your time in, the amount of dedication of the teachers, the principals, I've seen a lot of changes, but I have seen a consistent pattern of people who care, and it makes a difference. Um, again, not having children, I, I have a lot of children uh, <laughs> here in the school district. I, I take care of the property um, uh, the way I would if my children were in, in the facilities. Um, I feel well compensated. I, I'm very fortunate to have a, 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 an excellent team of crew, of crew members. Um, I feel heard, which is really important. I'm very fortunate uh, to have this position, and it makes it easier to dedicate myself to it 110%. So, thank you very much. We are fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Capturing Kids' Hearts and Foundations. Hi, yes, it's a timely um, evening for our presentation. Nate and I and um, some of our staff just got back from um, a foundations training session today. Um, so we want to give you kind of an overview of what our schools have been doing to provide structures around um, safe and um, civil and positive school environments. And um, part of that is foundations training, part of it is champs, part of it is capturing kids' hearts. So we'd like to just kind of summarize that for you guys. Uh, see, that's working. Okay. Um, so one of the kind of symbols or ideas that we had, and Kevin reminded me of it, Randy Sprick, who is one of the authors of Safe and Civil Schools Foundations Training, talks about how Disney really researches and provides an amazing experience for their customers from the time they come into the park to the time they leave. And part of that is they're trained um, to look for people who come out of the park with their family, um, you know, having had a great day and then having no idea where they have parked their car. <laughs> and so what um, some of the structures that Disney puts in place is videotaping all of the cars that come in at certain, you know, they're um, time stamped, license plates, so that when people come out, they are trained to, to know what that look is on a uh -huh. parent's face when they realize they cannot find their car, their kids are probably way overtired, they've had a great day, but it's time to go home. So they have um, people stationed all around the parking lots in their golf carts looking for people with that specific look on their face. They whiz right up, they whisk the people in the golf cart, they ask what time did you arrive, and they have everything in place to kind of research where that car might be. But along the way, they are trained to talk to those guests and ask them about their day, ask their kids about the day, what's been exciting for them, and before the guests know it, they have been escorted to their car in a location that they have forgotten. So um, it's a great example of kind of what foundations training is providing for our schools, um, both Lake Bluff Elementary School and Lake Bluff Middle School. Um, and like I said, we've been involved in it for a couple years. Nate's going to explain a little further what that foundations training is all about. So we've got the who, what, where, and what our goals are, oh, and when. Um, we have representatives from both buildings. Obviously, Margaret and I are both very much involved and attend all of the trainings. Uh, we have a team of representatives from both buildings. That's students, I'm sorry, that's teachers, uh, social workers. Um, the cohort is done in conjunction with NSSED. Uh, and we began meeting the, with the foundations group 
in the spring of 2015 and obviously it continues, it continued today and uh, we actually have one more meeting with our group uh, before we wrap things up and we're looking forward to sharing and celebrating some of the processes and uh, procedures we put into place within the building. Uh, obviously our goal uh, is to implement foundations which is a uh, positive uh, proactive behavioral support system. So just like that Disney World um, story, we are looking to provide those same structures and um, procedures for our staff so that we can almost um, predict or know when students need that support and we can do that in a positive way by providing safe hallways, safe entry and exit, um, and classroom climates that feel safe. In addition to that, we are um, training our staff and training ourselves to know what to look for when students are struggling with that so that we can provide supports to them to um, teach them those positive behaviors to make school a successful place. Margaret, should they have their um, graphic out on this? Okay. So one of the things that we've spent time doing as a team is looking at the different kinds of behaviors we encounter or anticipate we might encounter in our specific buildings. Um, and for our teachers, we wanted to be clear about uh, kind of what tier of specific behavior might fall onto uh, and be clear about how that might best be uh, addressed, whether it's something that we address at the uh, teacher level of the classroom, whether it's something that might need to be escalated sort of uh, to, the, to the principal level, or maybe there's a team component to it. Uh, but it's been very comforting to have uh, really a, a process and a procedure for replying and to responding to all of the different types of behaviors that we uh, see in school or anticipated that we might see in school. Um, We've also worked very closely with our teams to develop processes for problem solving. When we do have common issues that are occurring in all of our classes, our, our teams have a framework that they can work through uh, to address those problems. Often that's going to involve the student himself or herself. Uh, it may also involve input and uh, a visit from parents so that we're working together as a team uh, to address those issues that are, that are coming up. Um, all throughout our activities, the goal would be to be supportive, uh, recognizing that we're uh, teaching math, science, social studies, but we're teaching behavior as well. We're teaching kids how uh, to move through their day and how to work with one another, how to work with teachers. Um, we've also taken a, a very critical look at our facilities, at our, at our school buildings, and identified areas that we need to be aware of for properly supervising uh, and, and really being consistent with that supervision at all times. That's the important thing. And so. Uh, by working our way through the buildings, we've identified those, those tricky spots. Uh, we strategically placed our teachers and our supervisors to address those. And we've also gone about uh, teaching students how to function in those spaces and how to utilize our buildings appropriately. Uh, that was an exciting new challenge for us as we opened up a newly renovated uh, middle school uh, with a very different configuration than some of our students were accustomed to. Um, and of course, we want to celebrate our accomplishments. We want to uh, recognize students for uh, meeting expectations. We want to also model uh, the expectations for our students. So it's important that we recognize our teachers when that's being done as well. There's a variety of ways that we do that. So the foundation's training is kind of the umbrella that everything else fits under. It's our looking at the entire structure in our school and making sure that it feels safe and secure and positive for our students. Um, and so one of those um, pieces that Nate talked about was looking at how to support students behaviorally. And we've been working on training our teachers in that um, we have developed this multi-tiered system of behavior support. So we've identified behaviors that would be tier one behaviors, just as in the old RTI or MTSS, if you have the academic struggles, you might be getting tier one intervention or tier two or tier three. So tier one behaviors would be things that could be handled quickly and easily by a classroom teacher. Um, tier two behaviors might be tier one behaviors that are repeated or um, happen in a short time period. And tier three behaviors would be things that had to have like an immediate office referral. Um, so examples of behaviors would be excluding others, breaking the social contact or disruption. Those would probably be those tier two behaviors that might be repeated. And then the teachers have examples of corrections that might work for those behaviors. So a private and positive redirection, a timeout, or a positive behavior intervention. So we have been working to train the teachers on these menus um, in 
knowing that the checking and fouling from capturing kids' hearts was something that on the parent survey and in speaking with some parents that did not feel like a correction that was positive for students. So we are um, really delving really deeply into identifying behaviors and then corrections that are appropriate. One example um, that through our foundations training, we um, looked at all the different common areas in our building. One of our first ones was um, the hallway and then we worked on the playgrounds. One of the teachers from the Safe and Civil Schools who has instructed us in all of our training has come to observe our school and she's actually gonna be there tomorrow morning. She'll look at our arrival and dismissal, she'll look at the lunch hours, and just to sit down with us and give us feedback on those areas. But one thing we did is we had the student council work together to create a video for our students to, um, to see how they should behave in the hallway. <laughs> Let's have some staff and students in it. Mm -hmm. Those are our teachers. <laughs> procedures are uh, things that are very helpful to us as we transition from grade level to grade level and try and make sure that the cafeteria is clean and ready for the next group to come in. Uh, we identified, uh, much the same way elementary school did, uh, a need to work a little bit on uh, moving from class to class through the hallways, through the corridors. Uh, so we had a specific sign for that and even a, a fun buffer lesson uh, for that. Um, and, and as, as I said, I mentioned earlier, the, the new building presented some new challenges for us. The, the ramp that was once a uh, partial staircase and partial ramp that was uh, difficult to navigate did a fantastic job of managing traffic flow and keeping it slow. And so as we opened that up and made it easier for the lift to get in and out, we also created a, a bit of a drag strip for our students. So we, <laughs> we've worked on that and we've come up with some procedures for, uh, for that. Um, we also have guidelines for laptop usage Reminders of um, um, one of the graphics that you see repeated is a, is a bobcat, our mascot is a bobcat, and he's found his way into just about every uh, sign that you might see. So. Just as in the Disney example, we feel that the more you explicitly teach the behaviors to students, then they know exactly what to expect. And they actually bring up the point that you know, sometimes you assume that if a student is in sixth, sixth or seventh grade, that they should just know the expectations. Well, actually, that student has had probably 10 or 15 teachers 
telling him or her different expectations either every year or in every class and it actually is almost more confusing the older they get because they're getting different messages. So we're really trying to sync up that those expectations are common at each school and um, from classroom to classroom. Um, another really important piece that Foundations teaches us is just to celebrate um, those, that positive behavior and when things are going well. So um, we do that in lots of ways, both individual classrooms and then as a school. So in individual classrooms, the teachers, um, their students collect pause for good behavior. They get to vote on the kind of party they have to celebrate. And um, that is happening in all the classrooms in our building. Um, just last year, we started the students um, receive pause postcards from their teachers or any adult in the building. And then they bring those down to the office and Tracy or I make positive phone calls home. Um, last year, we made over 300 positive phone calls. And this year, we already have probably almost 150 that um, we've made at the beginning of the year. So um, that is very exciting for kids and really fun to see, and it makes our ratio of phone calls more positive than that. So it helps make our day um, great too. We this year have also incorporated, I mentioned at our September meeting, pause assemblies and then Fox families. Um, one thing that Foundations teaches us is to be sure that all kids have relationships with adults in the building. So if that isn't their classroom teacher, we want them to have exposure to other teachers so that they can create positive relationships. So our Fox families have a staff member and then a student or two from each grade level, and they're a little group that will travel through the years together, meet about four times a year with their Fox family leader. And then we've already talked about for our November um, Fox family gathering, they're gonna create a secret signal so that if they pass each other in the hallway, they can be like, you know, they're in my Fox family. So that create, that's another way for us to celebrate and create those positive relationships. One of the tools under the foundation's kind of umbrella is chance training. And what this is, is a consistent way for teachers to um, structure a, one particular learning activity. So a lot, most of our teachers in the building have either been to chance training through NSSED or they have um, worked with a team member to learn what those structures are. So you'll see this in a lot of our classrooms at the elementary school. And C is conversation, so they set that conversation level. A zero is no talking, a one's a whisper, two's with a partner, three is like an outside voice. Then they structure the help. So what should you do if you need help? So in a classroom setting, that might be ask your partner, raise your hands. In the lunchroom, that might look differently. So it's structured for every learning activity. Then they, they identify the activity as like an independent activity, a partner activity, and what the movement should be. So it could be, you can pick anywhere in the classroom for this activity. You can go to the bathroom without asking, those kinds of things. Um, participation is just telling the kids what they should be doing. So you should be reading and talking with your partner. And then as a success, how do we know that we have done that? So oftentimes teacher will, teachers will say things like, um, you will have a finished writing sample that you get to share with your partner. Um, so you really will hear teachers framing up every learning activity in their classroom with these CHAMPS um, guidelines. And again, it's just one tool for structuring up and teaching students exactly what behavior we're expecting. So with capturing kids' hearts, we've acknowledged that um, without establishing a positive relationship with your kids, uh, you're going to struggle to, to reach them academically and help them through what can very often be difficult times in a classroom. So uh, our goal is to also uh, make sure we're reaching them and appropriately challenging them academically, uh, but connecting with kids uh, when and where we can. Some things like greeting them at the door as they arrive. Uh, very often you'll see a teacher uh, having a, a shaking students' hands as they come in. Some students might prefer a high five, a fist bump. Some will come up with some other creative way to greet their teachers at the door, but it's just a great way to kick off the class period and communicate to kids, hey, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for making it on time. We're gonna get started pretty quickly. And very often that start may be just a, a quick minute and a half, maybe two minutes of opportunity for students to share good things. Uh, it's a term that, that they know uh, and, and often we'll, we'll 
want a little bit of time in the daily agenda for them to share good things. Sometimes teachers will have good things to share with their kids. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of following up on a good thing that they knew was occurring. I think a teacher asking a student that question, hey, how was that, that thing you did over the weekend? And you were excited about that race you were going to run in or that uh, trip to grandmother's house, how'd that go? Um, it really makes a big difference and you can see it in kids' faces when they get questions like that from their teachers. They appreciate remembering that. Um, also, uh, setting expectations for how classrooms are going to operate, expectations for how uh, their full group meetings are going to operate. So those social contracts are things that we work through at the beginning of the year. They're on display in classrooms, and they're something that everybody can refer back to to understand, oh yeah, this is what we agreed on, these are the norms that we're going to function within. Um, and, and certainly, again, giving students the opportunity to not only affirm one another, but um, often we'll get some affirmations ourselves. Uh, just this morning, I had a student comment on my haircut, and I appreciated that. <laughs> uh, good. So it's nice to see that students are feeling comfortable uh, reciprocating those affirmations. <laughs> and according to Bridget, in fourth grade, I rock like Taylor Swift. So um, <laughs> yes, which was a nice affirmation. Um, so we, with the foundations training, it is we're in this three-year cycle. So we're con constantly looking at um, the structures in place to make sure that they are supportive for our students. When we're finished with this training in the spring, we probably are just going to start right back at the beginning and start examining and looking at all those structures again. So one piece of that was helpful to get the parent feedback. I think one of those small um, components of capturing kids' hearts with the checking and the fouling was, some, was feedback that we got on the parent survey that felt very negative to kids and to families. So using what we've learned with our foundations training and um, implementing our multi-tiered kind of behavior menu of corrections that has felt like a more natural and a more consistent way for, um, in a more positive way for teachers to kind of respond to misbehavior. So that is kind of a very nutshell of the last three years that we've done the last three years of the work. So to understand, we, we're still doing capturing kids' hearts, but with modification based on the feedback that was given. Yes, it's one okay. of the tools under the whole umbrella of foundation. Oh, so it's just like if you are teaching reading, um, you might do a small group, you might do a read aloud, you might do you know lots of different techniques. So it's just one of the tools to help create that positive environment. So I remember for capturing kids' hearts, teachers were sent to training. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's how. So what do we do for foundations and what are we doing with the Capturing Kids Hearts? Now? Sure, absolutely. So the foundations has a core team. Um, Nate's building has five members. We have six. We've gone to this training that's been a three-year training. Then we have a larger committee at, our, at the school building that is part of that. The foundations brings back our work to the larger team of teachers who then are, represent all of the grade level teams. So that team structures up, what are the areas that we're gonna focus on? For example, we did hallways and playground. We're now working a little bit more on our lunchroom. And so that team kind of funnels information back and forth between the teachers, the um, core team, and the committee. Um, and so in getting the feedback regarding um, the components of capturing kids' hearts that were working and not working, that went through that larger committee um, of the foundations team plus the teachers. Does that answer your question? I think so, yes. Okay, can you describe the checking and fouling, what that process was like, and then um, what the modification has been? Sure, the intention for um, capturing kids' hearts is that it, gave, it gives students a tool to let a classmate know that um, they might not be following the social contract in a nonverbal way. So a check would be like just a signal to them saying, you know, hey, you know what, our social contract means we're supposed to be respectful, they're not being respectful. So the way I've seen that um, in past years was if kids are, say, in a, small, a group on the rug, listening to the teacher, and one student is kind of poking another student or laying down and not sitting up, their classmate might do the hand signal to say, you know, kind of like call them back to attention. So the intention was to kind of teach kids to um, work on solving their own problems and or try to, you know, let a, let a peer know that something that they were doing was breaking the social contract. I think um, understand concerns that we also need to be teaching kids to talk to one another about those things and to not have such a general way to do that. And that's where that menu of corrections 
where we can look at students really individually and um, help them modify their behavior by teaching the ways to do that. One would be using words, one might just be, you know, a shake of the head, whatever that might be. I would say that even at the middle school, uh, you'll hear me say uh, those words that we probably use with our small children. Hey, let's remember to use our words. What are some examples of things that you might do in a scenario like that? Would you like to hear what some other students have done in similar situations? Uh, these are the kinds of conversations that occur with individual students, not in front of a whole group, uh, but, but when a situation might arise that didn't go very well for them, helping to model for them, helping them to uh, have a way in which to respond differently the next time should it have not gone well for them. Um, but, uh, but certainly helping to teach kids how they might bring to someone else's attention something that they don't appreciate or don't like or may be unsafe. Um, so we still work on using our words even in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. <laughs> Are we getting feedback from the families on the new system or the new the modifications to capturing kids' hearts? Because I know at the strategic planning meeting there was a lot of negative feedback about mm -hmm. it. It was mostly focused on what you've articulated, the, the checks, and it sounds like that's gone. Are, are parents happy with the way it's working? Well, I think the, um, the other components of capturing kids' hearts that we showed on the slide, which things like the good news, social contract, the affirmations, um, the handshakes at the door, those are all ways that we create the positive culture and climate in our classroom. We're really using those components as a um, environmental kind of support to create a positive classroom. If we're, we're not using any parts of capturing kids' hearts to modify negative behavior. Okay. Anybody else? Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Thanks for putting that together. Sure. So, moving on, I'm looking at my list and I don't think we have a PTO report or an alliance report. No, we don't. Okay, and does Jay have a report? Jay has a report tonight. Okay. I just wanted to update the board on our transportation and hot committee. We had our first meeting last evening uh, and we had about a dozen people show up and the goal of the meeting is to share a lot of history and background information on what our costs have done plus ridership and difficult to good understanding of the situation. And uh, we had some good discussion on our bills that are represented in the board at the meeting. And I, I was just really impressed and uh, with uh, how the group received the information. I think they pretty quickly uh, understood the complexity of uh, reinstituting a fee and what that might do to uh, ridership on the bus, traffic congestion, tardiness, uh, and um, I think we're really open to um, kind of the set of problems that we're faced and perhaps instituting some sort of fee. One of the things that I thought was interesting, we'll have to see how this plays out, even the people that showed up that, um, you know, had, had the opinion that um, if my kid doesn't ride the bus, I don't need to pay a fee. Um, they actually turned pretty quickly when they began to see the, uh, the safety issue um, for even the walkers. And I think there was some pretty general receptivity, I thought by the end of the meeting, uh, in understanding the, uh, the financial situation that we're potentially up against, uh, understanding the resources that we put in just into general uh, child safety and getting to schools. I think there was some receptivity when you say, Jay, to um, you know, a, a safety fee. Um, so we'll see how this plays out, but I thought overall that um, it was interesting just to kind of watch them, just like, as we with school board members kind of grapple with kind of these competing issues. Um, I, I think they, they, they kind of grasp the complexity of, of the situation. I mean, we're looking at these, but also looking at other opportunities to reduce costs and reduce the population. We have had some good suggestions and things to think about. So I look forward to our next meeting on December 11th, where we'll be talking about what some options are in the case of scenarios and try to model what would happen in those cases. You know, I, I do think. <clears throat> I think any time you talk, think about instituting a fee or reinstituting a fee, I think the communication piece is going to be really important. And um, we probably don't need to do anything necessarily following this first meeting, but I think probably after this next one, um, 
beginning to work through a lot of the members there. We have representatives from Alliance, from the PTO, um, some sort of reporting mechanism out to um, the community based upon, you know, just giving them kind of a baseline of information of what's been, uh, what some of the facts are, what some of the preliminary um, solutions might be. I think we'd be well served to begin to distribute that out. Um, and I think we have pretty good representation there. Um, uh, just some logical people to kind of uh, begin to share that information. I think by the time we get to the point in March or whenever we're going to have to make some decisions, I think that's going to serve us well um, to, to kind of begin communicating those issues. Sooner we may, you may have to work with me on that so we can get some information out in my newsletter. Okay. Yeah. How, do we get, how do we get the participants, the members from the community? Did we invite people, or did we send out a general? We invited people. Today? We uh, had got some just suggestions from principals of people who they knew may have had issues with transportation, mm -hmm. or just uh, we're, we're looking for a diverse set of people, so people on different sides of town who have different yeah. busing needs. We also asked the PTO and the Alliance for Volunteers um, you know, to tap, tap some people, because they have a good network within the community and are involved. and. Um, we had a representative from the village uh, there as well. We had a, a police officer last night, so that kind of gave the per that perspective. So it was a pretty broad uh, group. So I agree with you. The opportunity for, for learning through an, a system like that is really unique, I think, to the participants in the room and you to rely upon them to share what they've learned with others. And so I just wanted to understand um, you know, how people might get involved if they were interested, because I think that the mm -hmm. progress that you made last last week would be, or yesterday, I guess, last was significant, significant for lots of people to understand at that level. Yeah. And there's just I, so little you can do with just a written communication. I mean, it's just so much more limited. But Yeah, I mean, we met for an hour and 15 minutes. I think one of the challenges going forward is that you've got... Uh, you know, nine to 12 people that were supplied with a baseline of information. And I think one of the challenges uh, going forward is as more people become aware of this being a real issue for the district, they're going to enter into the conversation maybe at a different point in time. Right. And I think we need to get in front of that. Right. Um, because if they come in, you know, the first alert may be, oh, the school district now is thinking about instituting a fee regarding transportation. Well, that's going to set up all kinds of alarms, and if they don't ask, under, necessarily understand the why, mm -hmm. and 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 start with the facts that the group enjoyed discussing uh, last night, um, I think they may come into those conversations um, pretty negatively. So, uh, and again, you know, I think um, I'm happy to work with Gene and, and Jay on um, some ways that we can um, communicate sooner rather than later with the community. I think, I think it will save us a lot of trouble come, come uh, March, April. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, you know, I think you know any reasonable person once they begin to understand the issue, um, they 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 immediately understand it. it's not an easy one to solve. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, there is no president's report. How about a superintendent's report? I do have just one comment, um, a reminder for all of our board members that two weeks from tonight, we do not have a regular board meeting. We're in closed session for our board self-evaluation. Uh, for the public's sake, our board policy dictates that we have a board self-evaluation to talk about how we do our procedures and our board business. Um, once every two years, and it will be our last time with Bartoni. She's retiring and bringing her new associate with us, so she will, we will actually have two people at that meeting. But just a reminder that it will be enclosed, so there is actually no meeting that night besides that. We're going to have that here to get it scheduled. Um, that will be at the district office with dinner. Okay. Uh, you'll have to talk to Shelley about that. <laughs> He did a good last time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to our discussions and go into a park discussion of park. And Dr. Rubenstein will provide a, some park comps. Uh, so it seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't such a long time ago that we 
we're talking just about our uh, park score reports, and um, since then, uh, the state has released the comparable scores for the rest of the state. And so I wanted to share those with you this evening. So just a couple of things. Yeah, there's, it's actually, uh, there you go. Okay, so um, so I wanted to provide you with information about that. Um, and then um, the other thing that you get to do as board members is to um, approve the posting of the school report cards, um, which are in your board packet this evening. So um, just uh, some pure comparisons. Um, and I know that all of you know this, but <clears throat> we have uh, several benchmark districts that we compare ourselves to. So uh, they are, um, uh, similar, they have similar demographics, high achieving, um, and a varying size and scope. Um, there are some other districts that we tend to watch that are local, um, and some of them are award winning. And um, prior to the scores being released publicly on October 31st, though um, they weren't really released on October 31st, they were actually really released on November 3rd because um, the state didn't get everything done. Um, uh, many of the districts agreed to release the data to each other um, to provide context and uh, um, do a little bit of planning. Um, and so I want to thank those districts publicly. Um, and uh, so just a little bit about the other districts that we compare ourselves to. Um, so uh, uh, you can see where we fall. Um, just a little bit of information here. So as I was putting this information together um, and putting the information um, on the slides, it looks like almost all of our comparables um, went up in terms of their enrollment. Um, uh, with the exception of um, North Shore 112, their enrollment um, fell actually um, by about 300 students this last year. Um, so North Shore 112 was the only one that went down. Everybody else either um, went up um, by about 20 to 30 students um, or stayed relatively the same. Um, and then uh, the low income and ELL numbers and students with disability numbers um, really stayed the same um, across the board. Um, as I, and I just know that because I was typing them in and like, oh, their numbers increased or they stayed the same, that sort of thing. So um, that's just <clears throat> a little bit of information about who we compare ourselves to. So again, below the blue line are, the, are not our actual comparables, um, but just some districts that we watch. And above the blue line are our actual comparison districts. And we use them for more than just um, comparing ourselves on um, the park assessment, but for a variety of other things um, related to salary and um, negotiations and those sorts of things. So um, when, and I don't know why it came out this way, um, this must just be a PDF thing. Um, when we looked at, when we looked at the um, score comparisons for ELA, you can see um, how, uh, you can just see that the fluff is in the green there. Um, and uh, where the districts fell from the bottom, um, not only just the line, just um, it, the scores, you can't really see the scores. So um, uh, uh, you can see that um, Lake Bluff had, um, I believe it was about 65% of their students who were um, meeting and exceeding um, on the ELA benchmark. Um, and so that would be about 65% of the students who were considered college and career ready. Um, and so again, um, uh, right in there with the rest of the districts, all of the districts that we compare ourselves to were fairly close in number, even if you look at uh, Libertyville, a little met, um, Lake Forest, all of us are within um, a couple of percentage points um, of each other <clears throat> um, as you look at them across the board. Um, then as you look at math, um, uh, similar, uh, similar scores there um, across the board. Um, and you have the, you can actually, I'm looking at Susan and she, I can see that you guys can see them more clearly in your board packet. Um, Not so, really. No, I can't. Yeah. Okay. No. So, um, but the numbers are written more clearly in your board packet. So. Um, 65 again, it looks like 65 again. Yeah. Um, 65 and 65. So, um, so those are actually um, on there. And um, uh, again, the numbers were very, very, um, tight within all of the districts um, and um, uh, people 
there were some districts as i was putting these scores in some districts that went up others that fell down a couple of points and others that stayed relatively stable over time and so um one thing that i would remind you last month when we talked about essa and the every student succeeds act is that this is the last time that you'll be seeing these scores in this context so this is the last time that we'll be looking at just achievement and in the future we'll be looking at achievement and growth and a whole bunch of other pieces over time and so that will actually really help us over time because i know what our behind the scenes scores look like there so then one of the things that we always look at here is our iep subgroup and i know that i know that this number is 17 percent that is relatively stable about 17 percent of our students were considered college or career ready and going all the way up to bannockburn which had about 44 percent of their students who were college and career ready that was at the top of the list and really there's not a great benchmark across the across the comparable north shore groups that we look at i would say that if you analyze these data and i have over time that the strong the higher number or higher percentage of students in your iep subgroup in general the better off your scores are going to be and because of the fact that our iep subgroup scores are because of the fact that we have a relatively lower number of iep students in our subgroup our scores may tend to tilt lower that's not an excuse for the lower numbers it is just that that's something to be to keep in mind and something that that i have thought about over time is it is it a data variability issue when you only get 10 kids in a group and one bombs one year they struggle with something that throws the whole thing off that it is it is it's also a situation where like if you know if 20 percent of your population is considered an iep subgroup that also means that in some situations you're probably over identifying and so some of those kids may not actually have as significant disabilities as the kids that we are identifying in our district is having disabilities do i remember correctly from last time when we talked about essa that this definition is going to change next year and we're going to have a bigger group of kids that are considered part of this subgroup you are correct so the iep subgroup will actually become the students with disability subgroup and it will actually split into two so it will be a student formerly with disabilities that we will be tracking and students with disabilities and they will both include students who have 504 plans okay so rather than the 12 percent that we currently have that number is likely to go up to probably closer to 25 or 30 percent okay when i look at the the score comparisons for math ela or this iep subgroup um i know that we make an effort if we see another school district doing well we make an effort to go out and see what they're doing and i'm curious um if you know this off the top of your head like who have we already talked to have we already talked to deerfield lincolnshire um i don't know both formally and informally to just about every district that is up there so yes um so uh formally um through um uh like curricular conversations between um all of us um at meetings that we have on a regular basis and then informally just over um coffee and that sort of thing what are you guys doing and what does that look like and uh through information exchanges i i um, mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that um, some of us had agreed to share our scores mm -hmm. um there is a, a pretty regular um, information exchange that occurs between several districts now um, where people just are sort of saying hey what are you doing with um, or what are you doing about um, and then people are exchanging information that way and so that's the sort of thing that's going on and so we are reaching out more and more um, all the time 
that's happening across but the country. But do you feel like you get, we're getting useful information back from that? I mean, Absolutely. you know, mm-hmm. like, as an example, Deerfield is a lot bigger than we are, so, I don't mm-hmm. know, maybe some of that stuff works differently. Do you find that you get, you know, I assume everybody's cooperative, but is there stuff that we get out of that that's, that's helping us move forward or not Absolutely. Really? I think all of us come back from meetings and say, hey, I talked to so-and-so. You know, from Deerfield's a good example because Mike Lubafield's our superintendent mm-hmm. and I see each other a lot. Kelly and Kevin have meetings and, with people in their district and we'll say, hey, I heard they're doing such and such. And that's usually where I hear, okay, that's great, I'll contact someone. Or we're already doing a version of that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's something we'll talk about with our consultants. Mm-hmm. So we really share, and even the, the districts beyond the line, we also contact that group. For instance, before we changed the math curriculum at the middle school, we had several teachers go over mm-hmm. to Avoca because mm-hmm. they already use our math curriculum, and their scores have been consistently higher than ours. Right. So, and um, and the other thing to to note about that is that um, it's not just us reaching out to them. The school districts are regularly reaching out to us. We're still considered among yes. the best of the best. I mean. This context is a very narrow context, so school districts all across the state and all across the North Shore are still reaching out to us to say, hey, what are you doing and um, uh, really what is going on and can we get in on your Lucy Calkins training or on your Bridges training or, um, you know, I understand that you guys are implementing um, college preparatory math and what does that look like and um, I understand that you're double double accelerating and can we come and take a look at uh, how that might work in our schools and those sorts of things. So um, people are reaching out to us all the time and we are uh, more than happy to collaborate. I just, and I appreciate that, you know, I, I think that particularly in the last, say, four or five years, I think our district has done a lot mm-hmm. to change how we use some things to really improve that. But just looking at this, you know, 81% versus, you know, for Lincolnshire versus, what's our, 65? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a, it's a, big so it's a significant enough difference that mm-hmm. I, ho- I really hope that we're investigating mm-hmm. Okay, how, what, what made that happen? Mm-hmm. I, I, I agree with you. I, okay. And um, I want you to know that we are, um, you know, every single percentage point and every single student and every um, gain made um, by every other district were investigating how did you do that, what did that look like, um, what are you doing differently than us to see what we can get there. Sometimes it's an easy answer. Um, it's like, why didn't we think that? Um, right. Most of the time, it's, it's not. Um, and so, um, you know, we have to take the hard way. So, um, so um, then um, you looked at, uh, in your board packets, you have your, the school report card uh, data. So the Illinois Interactive Report Card uh, publishes that report card data for all Illinois schools. Um, again, this is gonna. Uh, this is heading for a major overhaul this year. Um, it has some really nice comparison data on spending, um, student achievement, climate, and other factors that impact students in schools. Um, so it now also includes um, special education student environments. So um, the percentage of students that are in um, general education for over 80% of the day, over 40% of the day in separate educational environments. That was something that had been at a separate site. It's now there. Um, and the board is um, required to review and publish the results. Um, one of the other things that's also on there is the Algebra 1 completion rates. Um, and so um, our Algebra 1 completion rate is always, um, again, amongst the top. Um, and so that is um, up there, and I know that that number says 97.4, because um, I remember that off the top of my head. Um, and Bannockburn is 100%. And then um, just to emphasize a little bit of uh, the future plans, I talked a little bit before, this is the last time that um, we're gonna see these scores in this context. So there's this ESSA accountability rubric, which um, Jean and I are becoming really intimately um, Uh, acquainted with. Um, We get to do a lot of presentations and attend a lot of presentations um, over the coming months. 
um, which is, is, should be really good. Um, there, it's going to include um, a whole bunch of new student growth measures and really account for growth in the subgroups. Um, and that's going to be a big piece there. So this is really the last time that we're going to see this um, in this context. Um, and so there is, um, you know, the last time that you're going to see the districts ranks ranked this way. Um, we are going to continue our review of the curricular programs and supports. So we have now had three um, meetings with our um, multi-tiered systems of support and um, RTI core team. Um, and so they are meeting and they are um, looking at everything district-wide, um, top to bottom. Um, and really, we've started each of our conversations with the areas that we um, that tripped us up the most, um, and those were actually in third and fourth grade. Um, what's challenging us in third and fourth grade the most, and um, what areas of the curriculum do we need to document better and um, do more in, um, in third and fourth grade. Um, and so we're going to continue that work. Um, and then um, Kelly is really working hard with the math and English language arts teams um, to develop these uh, curricular documents. Um, related to the new Lucy Hawkins units of studies and units of study and um, bridges and make sure that um, everything is covered across the board. Um, and then um, we um, and you uh, need to really consider using these data from these assessments and in the Illinois report card, what's publicly available as metrics um, um, in the strategic plan. It's all publicly available. Um, again, it's easily, uh, there's lots of comparable data is what I'm saying to you. So um, the five essentials, the per, the per pupil spending, the student achievement, the algebra completion, the teacher retention rates, teacher absence rates, those sorts of things are all available on the student report card um, and will continue to be so. Um, so those might be things that you may want to consider in, as inclusion, uh, as including on the strategic plan as metrics um, because it's always helpful when we don't have to do our own surveys um, and when it's just another piece of available data there. Um, any uh, questions that I can answer for you? Before I, we, we vote on this, this time, mm -hmm. right? yep. is the only piece that surprises me is that our district finances, maybe this is a question for Jay, but um, district finances, the cost per people is actually going down each of the last three years? That, and it's, I think, related mostly to an increase in the number of students. In the population. Yeah. So it, that's pretty, you know, varies because we're so small. We're very sensitive to the number of students. I see. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So now we go to item nine B, strategic planning, and Dr. Sophie's going to take us through that. Um, I just want to go through the data for time limitations today. We're going to hold off on making any big decisions and discussions, but. Um, the very last strategic planning meeting that we had, um, we actually did some light voting on all the data that has been presented. So I want to walk you through the colored handouts that you have, and I will be sending you a, um, an electronic version of this before we do some board work on it. Basically, though, the guiding principles, when you look at this, and somehow the red didn't show up at the bottom, but the red was the very first highest priority. So. If you look down at the bottom, we had 17 people say that that is their highest priority, that the best interests of students have to guide every decision. And then if you read up, four more people put that, um, the social and emotional wellness um, is integral. That was their first priority. And then creating lifelong learners, it looks like one person put that as their highest priority. And you work your way through, the second highest priority was green. So the group that had the highest green number was the social and emotional wellness. So you can kind of work through that piece. The next page has Village of Lake Bluff guiding principles. Mark had mentioned before the possibility of us having a guiding principle or two the same as the village and the park district will be doing the same thing. So I just copied out what their guiding principles are for your review. And then we have for goal one, two, three, and four. Um, and we had light voting on all of those based upon 
the current indicators under each one of those four goals, and then we got some additional feedback on those. And then finally, we wound up with, what is your vision for where Lake Bluff 65 should be in 2023? Um, and people ended with writing about, I'm excited about, I wonder about, I'm concerned about, have you thought about? And this was uh, the last strategic planning meeting. So this really combined with um, all the other pieces of data has allowed and will allow our administration to go back and start working on the board goals. Um, but we do need to have some discussion from all of you as to what the guiding principles should be and a review of our board goals in general to see if you want these same four board goals, do you want to add another type of board goal? Um, and then we will come back based on the feedback with what we think should be some indicators and certainly we'll be asking for your feedback on that. And then finally, we will bring back the metrics as that Kevin just talked about as to our suggestions on how you would monitor our performance. So this is very good data, and I thought I would share it with you now. I'll share it electronically, and we'll do some further discussion in the coming months. How many people actually participated in this? How many do we have at the last meeting? We have quite a few people out at the last meeting. How many actually? We're scored on this report. Um, I'm going to tell you right now. 20, we had about 25 out of the out of the 40. We had quite a few. The uh, the Cubs had one of their final games that night. So. So it's a fairly small amount with respect to the total number of students we had, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had a good turnout at all the other meetings. We just this meeting we had less. Yeah. So. Okay. I'm not sure that's representative of the community, but we got representative of the people that showed up anyway. Well, and the community results, we are part of that community survey that you should have all filled out. Um, I'm expecting to get those results before Christmas. And those are true community results. So, the measuring similar... All different types of metrics so that you have all the information possible. Any other questions for Dr. Sophie on that? So item 9C is the supplemental debt service levy and J, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Yes. Who would I want? 8C? Mine says 9C. 8C. Yeah. Okay. Can't do that. No, no. It's, oh, okay. It's, All right. It's different yeah. on this one. Uh, supplemental debt service. So Jay Khan is going to take us through the, the supplemental okay. property tax levy. This is something you'll be asked to vote on in, at the December meeting, uh, and it deals with the property tax limitation law, which gets a little bit complicated, but essentially when we, nor when we issue normal debt, the county clerk automatically levies the, enough to pay the, the principal and interest payments out for the life of the bonds. These non-referendum bonds that were issued in 2015 were issued under the debt service extension base, which we abbreviate as the DSEB, and that number is not known. It's, it changes, it grows every year by CPI, so they can't automatically extend the payments uh, because they don't know what their debt service extension base will be from year to year. So the resolution you're passing essentially tells the county clerk our new debt service extension base is X, you are free to uh, extend enough debt service up to this amount um, to pay off the principal and interest on the bonds. And if we, so if we don't do this, they continue to extend uh, the last number that they have because they, they need to be informed of what the new number is. I, I know we, we and I talked about this the other day, it gets a little complicated, but maybe, can you give a brief explanation of what the DSEB, why it was put in place in the first place? Sure, when the, when the property tax limitation law was put in place, we're all pretty familiar with the impact to the operating levy, which is the amount we ask for for operations. Um, that that's limited every year, the increase is limited to the CPI, greater of the CPI or 5%, the lesser of the CPI or 5%. It also impacts your debt service levy. Um, basically, the total amount of um, debt service that you had on your books that you extended for that in the year that the law went into place, um, the they would allow you to uh, basically to levy that amount every year after that. And then, in and then at some point they amended the law to allow it to grow with CPI. 
Uh, so the law was put in place in this county in 1994. So our debt service extension base is essentially the amount of interest and principal payments we had on non-referendum debt in that year. And so the law says that we are allowed to issue bonds um, hereafter as long as the, the debt service payments don't exceed that amount. Uh, and then in 2009, they amended the law to allow that amount to increase with CPI, sort of in the same way that the operational levy is allowed to increase with CPI. So um, every year that our debt service extension base changes, it increases it slightly. And when we issued the bonds for the middle school, we issued them with increasing payments because we knew that our debt service extension base was going to go up. So um, we're, we're, what this resolution does is it tells the county clerk our old debt service extension base was this, our new one is that, um, so that they can, because that's their limit on what they can extend from debt service. Most importantly, if we didn't do that, we'd have to pay that incremental out of our own operating expenses. Right. Correct. So uh, they will continue to extend the existing payment or the existing um, debt service extension base. But as I said, our interest and principal payments grow at 2% a year. So that difference would have to be paid out of operations or out of um, fund balance if we don't update that number with the county clerk. Questions? Anybody? Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're on to action. And we're going to begin with uh, a motion for approving the resolution regarding the estimated amount to be levied for the year 2017 and setting of the truth and taxation hearing. <coughs> so moved. Second. Truth and John Rosen? Yes. Le Leanne Charlo? Yes. Julie Gottschall? Yes. Richard uh, Philip Hood? Yes. Susan Ryder? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. Thank you for moving that along. Yeah, we got, got a quick secretary here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Doing well. I am. The previous one in the. No, you're <laughs> sure. I did too. No, I did not. <laughs> Uh, we are talking about the approval of the annual statement of affairs and the school code states that the school district and joint agreements are required to complete an annual statement of affairs and publish in local newspapers all south of schedules, better contracts over $2,500. Uh, also required to submit complete electronic forms to the Illinois State Board and do you have any questions or comments about that? We do this every year. Yeah, it's our usual. So moved. So we have a motion to approve the annual Second. statement of affairs. <laughs> So moved. Roll call please. Second. Leanne Charlin? Yes. Julie Gottschall? Yes. Philip Hood? Yes. Susan Ryder? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Um, item C, approval of school di school and uh, district report card that was discussed by Dr. Rubenstein. Do we have any further questions or comments on that? No. We have a motion to approve the school and district report cards. So moved. Second. Julie Gottschall? Yes. Philip Hood? Yes. Uh, Susan Ryder? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Leah Charla? Yes. Uh, item D, uh, the personal report. This uh, month we have, uh, let's see, we have a non licensed resignation of David Pookie, who was a teacher aide at the middle school, run for personal, reason, uh, personal reasons effective of October 31st. We have a licensed FMLA request for uh, Sarah Haslow, who was a teacher at the middle school, uh, extending that leave to December 4th. Also for Mallory Jorgensen, a middle school teacher, and extending her leave to December 13th. We also have a nice non-licensed FMLA, FMLA leave act request. The Marjil, teacher's aide at the elementary school, uh, effective 11-9 through 11-27 of 17. And we have a non-licensed leave of absence without pay for uh, Jose, Hernandez, Jose Hernandez in maintenance at the elementary school of one year leave of absence. Effective 927. I have a motion to approve the personal report for November 14th. Second. Roll call, please. Philip Hood? Yes. Susan Ryder? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Leanne Charlow? Yes. Julie Gottschall? Yes. And finally, on actions, we have the consent agenda. This month's consent agenda includes the open session meeting minutes for October 24th, 2017, regular Board of Education meeting, the treasurer's report, the impress report, the bills report, and the P-card report. Would anybody like any of that pulled out for further discussion? No. So, may we have a motion to approve the consent agenda for November 14th, 2017? So moved. Second. I'll roll call vote, please. 
Uh, Susan Ryder? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Leanne Charlo? Yes. Julie Gottschall? Yes. Philip Hood? Yes. Motion is approved. Um, we are done with this, uh, action items and item 11, 10 is FOIA requests. There is one if anybody is interested, it's available on the board book. Uh, finally, we would like to address the board for uh, with public comment. Please do. <laughs> Just uh, state your name okay. and where you're from. Three sixty was shared in place with love. Parent. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I'm a teacher as well in a nearby district, and uh, I was I've been in conversations with district administrators and teachers since spring when I was when I learned of um, cap capturing kids' hearts, captivating kids' hearts. Uh, my son kept coming home with stories. I brought them to the teachers and administrators. I had lots of questions. I didn't get many answered. I was told I was probably the, I was the only one with concerns. We'll do a survey. The survey came out. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> changes, changes were made. They got rid of the files and checks. Great. Um, but it just, um, it's so bizarre to me <laughs> that it took place. And it took place for three years. And both of you brought up great questions tonight, but I don't think they were answered. As I was sitting there, I didn't, I didn't hear an answer. And so um, as a teacher for many years, I know um, best practices is what we should all be doing, and people in education love to slap on a new name to what is common sense, communication, mm -hmm. eye contact. We don't need an expensive program from, you know, such as this, and it sounds like, okay, now it's out, three years in, three years out, and something else is coming in. Is that needed? I just hope there's checks and balances. As a, as a parent and a teacher, I just feel like the trust suddenly is a little shaky. Like I'm shocked that this went on in a K-5 building. Shocked. So there's lots of stories out there. I don't think they've been gotten, um, I don't think they've been received or, and these questions haven't been answered. So if that's going on, it just brings up other questions to me, so. And what questions specifically would you like answered? So, was there a committee that really looked at the checks and balances, and and then when like is was there a group of people, including teachers, any parents and administrators that made that decision, and as it was implemented, was there feedback? Are teachers allowed to give? Is it an open dialogue where they're able to say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this, because um, I would be shocked to hear that most or all right. were in I could answer almost all of those. There was not a parent committee, but staff are always involved in decisions, bringing programs in like this, um, coming up with ideas of their own programs to look into. <clears throat> staff were very involved with this. And we had overwhelming support from staff uh, when, we, when they were all being trained. And like I said, it's been in, like I told you before, it had been in uh, effect for about three years, and you are the very first parent we heard anything from. Although certainly not the last, <laughs> because I got in your vote, that's strategic, from yeah. a whole variety of parents. But and, that's why and, there were a lot of changes that were made up right, too. Yes. Good to hear. So, Although I do think, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think there's some other good questions implicit in Amy's comments about, you know, how much do we spend on all of this training? Because as I, as I heard the presentation, a lot of it is common sense. I mean, I have to agree with that. So I'm just wondering, and, and we had a discussion about capturing kids' hearts when there was going to be another big outlay for it, and there, mm -hmm. we pulled back on that, which I, obviously was the right decision. But I, I think the question about what, you know, what, what's the resource for this, and is it a good return on investment? Is it a, a good thing to look at? And I will tell you, the training through NSSED is relatively inexpensive. That's part of our co-op expense that we pay for. Um, and we are, we're getting, we feel like we're getting a really good bang for our buck on it. Mm -hmm. um, I do realize that it sounds like it's very common sense, but actually having a program to follow, oh, is a, uh, we just don't have people to put things together like that. And I don't think I, any district does. I don't think your district would have that either. And it's not being done, and it was not being done consistently at all. Yeah, I've been in three different schools and we, we've had different, we, we've paused. You know, everybody, mm -hmm. the state is man mandating that, and that works, uh, and it has the positive aspects. 
and then you know the logical consequences and reteaching them. Every school I think makes their own. Right. I haven't I haven't been a part of a school where they've had a special program uh, or anything like this that was is was brought on as non traditional and self managing. That was odd. And I'm just so uh, thank you for listening. And that just um, I, the communication to parents in the beginning, like when it was first introduced. If I had a kindergarten that year, and I didn't get a, I didn't get any information that my child was going to be told to check Johnny when she, when he's bothering, you know, when she when I'm being when mm-hmm. she's being bothered, rather than Johnny, cut it out, <laughs> get in your own space. That's 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 shocking to me. And then they, I'm so grateful that they listened to the parents on the survey and they made a change. But again, no communication. So I just that that's alarming to me. Um, and I love the schools. I love absolutely love the teachers we've had for our children, and um, I'm grateful for the community. Thank you for listening, but it, they're deep concerns, and I feel like they're valid questions. Mm-hmm. And thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Amy. No other public comment, I don't think. Not seeing any, we have a motion to adjourn at 8.27. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.